We've all been affected in so many ways in such a short amount of time. It's like nothing we can think of in our history. Every area of our lives has been influenced the way we socialize, the way we educate, the way we worship. Some businesses have closed, shut down almost overnight. Some luckily have been able to adapt. And no, I haven't been driven to drink. I'm standing in front of Western New York Energy, a plant that until recently has made ethanol, the additive we put in gasoline in our cars. Now, in an effort to adapt, to help, this company has geared up to produce something that we've all been looking for, hand sanitizer. I guess the first question is, give me a little bit of history of the plant. Uh, this facility was the brainchild of uh, John Sawyer. Um, he, uh, he wanted to start a new business, uh, something to help out farmers, and uh, ended up with this project. And uh, so we've been producing since uh, December of 2007. Um, the plant was originally designed to produce 50 million gallons of fuel grade ethanol a year. Um, we're currently capable of producing 65 million gallons. The uh, plant was a $90 million investment at the beginning, and uh, we've invested another $15 million since then in improvements and expansions, and really partner with the local farmers to, uh, to produce these products. We currently, uh, this year, will grind close to 20 million bushels of corn. And 65 million barrels uh, uh, or gallons, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, is that, how is that uh, volume-wise compared to other uh, plants around the country? There are plants that are smaller and there are plants that are larger. There are some that may be half our size and there are some that are close to twice our size. Kind of medium Correct. size. Correct. Um, okay, so now you've transitioned to another product. You're making hand sanitizer. Correct. How did that come about? When, uh, when we heard the governor announce that uh, there was, uh, they were going to pr be producing their own sanitizers. Um, most formulas of sanitizers involve a large amount of alcohol. Um, our production process is essentially producing 200 proof alcohol. For the fuel side, we would just denature it at the end with a low grade gasoline or that for fuel. But through some help from DC, from Albany, we were able to get a permit that allows us to sell our 200 proof alcohol um, for these uses, uh, for sanitizers. Now, 200 proof, that's basically 100% alcohol. Correct. Uh, and it's a pure product. It's... There are some impurities. Our distillation is a little different than some of the beverage grade, but for the use of sanitizers, it's very close uh, to that, yes. And how does this affect your ethanol production? Is it cutting into the volume that you do? Well, it is, but um, as you can imagine, gas demand is down dramatically. People just aren't driving, they aren't driving as far. Um, some estimates have uh, uh, gasoline demand down as much as possibly 60% or even higher. And so uh, obviously if we're not selling it for fuel, we were looking for a way to keep our production up and also do our part to help out during this crisis. How's the, the process actually different from the ethanol? You're, you, I think you mentioned you're you're basically not adding a, a, a gasoline additive. Mm -hmm. uh, is that pretty much it? You're, so you're stopping the process at some point, and it's a relatively easy transition then? Fairly, yes. Um, to your point, yes, we don't d add that fuel to nature in at the end. Uh, the FDA has us adding a, a, a bittering agent just to make sure kids don't drink it, things of that nature. But yeah, for the most part, we've had to tweak our process a little bit, um, pull out a few of the impurities that wouldn't matter in fuel. But uh, yeah, we've been able to do it. I'm very proud of our uh, whole team here. Um, they've all seen the opportunity and uh, um, seen that you know we have a way to help uh, our neighbors and downstate uh, New York, obviously the the kind of the hot spot, if you will, in the in uh, the U.S. right now and. Uh, uh, it's really, just like I said, it's given us an opportunity to keep producing and at the same time do our part to help out. Now, some of this looks like it could be uh, uh, consumable mm -hmm. alcohol, and you, you want to 
caution people that this is not something that you should drink. Absolutely. And what would be the consequences of somebody taking a drink of this? First of all, it wouldn't taste very good, I bet. Well, there is peroxide and some other component chemicals in there, so no, it wouldn't taste very good. And then again, the, the bitterant uh, that the FDA is having us add, um, they would, people would spit it out. It is horrible tasting. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, uh, trust me, if you get it on your fingers, you're going to know it. Okay, and what's the difference between this? I mean, when we see hand sanitizer, when we've seen it in the past, it's this gel mm -hmm. that you, you know, rub on your hands. Now, this is just a liquid, and so there's a difference there in consistency. Mm -hmm. Is there any other differences between what we've been used to and, and this product? Uh, from my understanding, and I'm not an expert, um, there are a lot of different formulations you can use. With the crisis in trying to produce larger volumes, uh, most, including these two uh, distillers, are using the World Health Organization formulations. And the, that basically is alcohol, whether it be ethanol or uh, possibly another alcohol, um, with a couple other chemicals mixed in it. And so uh, this, this you, we can do in a little bit larger volume, from what I understand, a little bit uh, easier than some of the gel uh, formats. But, People are taking these, they're using it in spray bottles to spray it on door handles. You can use it to spray on the floor. Obviously, you can use it on your hand as well, hands. Um, so a um, lot of different uses for them right now. And is it just as effective as other formulas? Mm -hmm. It's basically the same same uh, uh, quality in terms of Correct. killing you know, germs and whatever, viruses. Most of the information that I've seen from like the FDA and CDC is they want the alcohol to content to be at least 60 to 65 percent. Um, these two that are sitting in front of me are 80 percent. And so they're well strong enough uh, to, to, you know, take care of the virus and, uh, you know, hopefully protect all of us. Now, this is going to be a dumb question, but give me a smart answer. <laughs> Why does alcohol kill impurities like or viruses and, mm -hmm. and bacteria? I am not a biochemist and I don't <clears throat> pretend to be, but I believe it has something to do with the alcohol nature where it will dry and uh, uh, it breaks down the uh, cellular component. But like I said, I'm not an expert, just what I've heard from others. Now, this plant is in Med Medina. Mm -hmm. How many people work here? We are just uh, uh, right under 50. I think we're at 49 today. We have uh, the plant as well as a trucking company. Um, we haul feed and corn, um, but uh, yeah, uh, very proud of our staff, and uh, most of us are from this area. Um, myself, I'm born and raised in Medina, and um, probably almost half of our plant is. And so uh, to be able to do something like this, not only just for our neighbors, but for region in general, uh, you know, we're very proud of. And, and, and Medina is an, an ideal place for it because you're, you're basically in the heart of farm country. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's got to be basically a, a very good place to have this kind of a, an operation. Absolutely. Um, this location was picked for several different reasons. Um, one of them being because you mentioned like corn. Um, we're located in about the uh, five or six largest corn growing counties in New York State. In addition to that, we also use uh, clean renewable hydroelectricity to power the plant. And uh, our proximity to Niagara Falls gives us that availability. And we were talking before, and you mentioned that uh, for people who don't know much about ethanol, which is what you make, uh, or this product, the corn that you use in the process is not taking away from so much from the edible corn, the, the corn that we have on the, t the dinner table, mm -hmm. it's, it's, so it doesn't really drive up the price of, of corn that we get at the market. It, you, can you explain that a little bit? Absolutely. No, great question. Um, there's been ongoing debate over the years, the food versus fuel, uh, and it's been shown time and time again that's, that's not that at all. We do not use sweet corn, which would be a consumable, or there's different white corns that are grown out in the Midwest. We use what would be referred to as either field or feed corn that a cow might eat or a pig or things like that. And for a lot of those animals, we're taking the starch out, using it to produce alcohol, and we're putting the other co components back out as high quality co-products that are going right back out into that feed market. So for instance, a dairy cow might, be, might not be eating the whole kernel of field corn, but they're getting all of the protein and fiber back from us in the form of uh, what we refer to as our dairy distiller's greens. 
now that you've transitioned over, uh, how, what percentage is going to be your ethanol and what percentage is going to be the hand sanitizer? Things are really starting to ramp up. Um, I would say that, you know, uh, over the last couple weeks, this has been about 15 to 20 percent of our production, but um, I see with these distillers and some larger scale uh, producers, um, I can see that it very well could be 50 percent or more of our production over the next uh, couple months. Hmm. Now, does this change basically, I guess it has to, who you're doing business with as opposed to, you know, the, the, the companies that you've dealt with before and now this is a whole new market for you? Absolutely. These are all uh, people that we've never dealt with. So all new customers, all new uh, uh, arrangements, new relationships. I see a couple of different uh, samples here mm -hmm. and these are different businesses uh, that, I mean, one of the, you said is in Clarence. Actually. Yeah, this is uh, this bottle here is from uh, Uncle Jumbo's uh, right in Clarence. Um, and uh, this one here is from uh, Black Button Distilling in uh, uh, Rochester. How far is this product going to go now? How far are you going to distribute it? Well, they're distributing it. I just have examples to show you where it's going. But uh, from what I understand, it's staying pretty close. Uh, Uncle Jumbo's, uh, I believe he's working with Tops and a lot of the other different Buffalo uh, retailers, uh, things of that nature. Uh, Black Button, I know, is distributing to a lot of the different hospitals and uh, businesses. Um, we have another producer uh, in Rochester as well, uh, east of Rochester, that's making his product in 55-gallon drums, and he's supplying large grocery store chains and things like that that need larger volumes than, you know, a smaller bottle. So are you shipping in bulk to these companies, and then they bottle it, and they distribute it then from there? Correct. We ship them the denatured alcohol. They're in a, either a 275-gallon tote or in a tanker then they're doing their formulations, the blending, and the bottling. Mm. How, how quickly uh, what, were you able to ramp up, or you're still in the process of ramping up on this, right? The, the, biz, the, the sales have taken time to develop. Um, as I'm sure we're all used to by now, things are changing day by day, and that's been the situation here as well. A lot of different regulatory agencies had to work on some changes, um, whether it be from the federal side, New York side. And so it's been a transition for people to understand what can I do, what can I do. And it's taken time to get there, but as people have figured out the process, ordered bottles, things of that nature, um, you imagine these bottlers, for instance, you know, take Black Button, um, you know, they've had to revamp some of their bottling lines in that to be able to do this. Um, same with uh, Uncle Jumbo's. I mean, they're trying to pick sizes that are close to, I believe, some of their uh, distilled products. But, uh, but yes, to your point, it's just taking time for everyone to understand what can I do, what can I do. But uh, we're starting to see some uh, increased volumes every day. Uh, the, now, you mentioned the, the regulations and federal and versus state, and are, are there a whole different set of rules between the fuel and ethanol-related product? And, and the sanitizer related product? There are different grades. Uh, there's everything in between from fuel ethanol to beverage grade to a full industrial grade alcohol. Um, and yes, they're all regulated, um, especially at the federal level. Um, it's highly regulated and not only that, but uh, if, you're, if you're producing a beverage grade alcohol, it's also subject to a fairly significant excise tax, um, which in the, in the uh, uh, COVID and the uh, coronavirus uh, package that Congress passed, they waived the excise tax through the end of the year to help support businesses like this that are using the alcohol to produce sanitizers. Um, but yes, the regulatory side has been a challenge. Um, the, uh, some of the federal agencies we had to deal with at the onset, uh, I have to say, I have to commend them, they were great. They, uh, they knew what they needed to do to help us. Um, New York State has been very helpful, but there are some things that I think they could probably work to do better. For instance, uh, they're making their own sanitizers, but currently they're not buying any alcohol from me. So I'm not sure where it's coming from, if it's out of state or not. And how is the supply um, for you? Mm -hmm. Is it pretty consistent? Uh, I know it could depend on weather, it could depend on season. Uh, it, how do you handle um, supply problems? with? your source material. You mean for, for like corn? Yeah, for corn. Luckily, most of the farmers in this area have their own storage. 
And so we're contracting out several months ahead. And so uh, we, we haven't had any issues. Um, I will say this, over our 13 years, I've never had to slow the plant down or shut the plant down because we ran out of corn. Interesting conversation with Tim Winters of Western New York Energy. Stay tuned, we'll be right back after this. Welcome back to our conversation with Tim Winters of Western New York Energy. This is a very interesting conversation with a lot of information. Let's get back to the conversation. The demand for gasoline is down mm -hmm. and the demand for sanitizer is up. So right. is this all going to balance out or do you think your volume is going to have to go up? I'm hoping that it maintains. Um, one of the things that these, these plants are not designed to run at very slow rates. And so once you get below like a 50% rate, you start running into some inefficiencies. So our hope is that we can maintain our prior to COVID rates, but we do have the potential to ramp up if the need is there. Are you going to be dealing with overseas uh, or Canada? Or uh, we're not really set up for that, but we have some partners that we're having some discussions with. What, what's the difference in cost between this and sanitizers that... Uh, we're used to that, like before this last month or two, that we've been used to the gels and the, mm -hmm. the typical sanitizers. I, like everything else, I'm sure there are some pretty crazy prices being traded out there. Um, I will say I will commend most of the people that I've talked to and that we're working with. Uh, most of the conversations are, we're not gonna, we don't want to be one of those price gougers. We're just trying to figure out a way to keep our business operating, and cover our cost and help. And so. Uh, I think everybody uh, that I've talked to is trying to be fair and uh, get the product into hands uh, rather than at this point, I don't think anybody's looking to uh, make a huge amount of money. Depending on the health of the nation and where the virus goes and how things, the conditions are, do you th see this as a product that you're going to continue to manufacture going forward or just dependent on the, the, the situation? To your point, I think it's going to be kind of a fluid situation, but I will say this, when I kind of started down this road, uh, when we started down this road about a month ago, I would have thought maybe this is a few month type project, but uh, in talking to different folks about the contracts they're working out, the demand that they see, I see the potential this could go on for a year or more. Um, and so. Uh, we're hearing people putting contracts in place for 12 months or more. Um, I think that as we get further into this, I think people's habits are changing. Um, so six months from now, are you not going to wipe down your grocery cart when you go to Tops or that? I, I, I don't know. I, th I think people are going to still do that for, for a period of time. Um, as far as a part of our business, uh, this is something that from the industrial side or beverage side of alcohol, it's something that we're already in the process of trying to do. Um, this actually kind of just expedited. Um, we're not quite to where we want to be, but uh, yeah, I think this has the potential to be a, a, an addition to our business going forward. And it, basically, you didn't really have to change much in the way of infrastructure in the business. You, it's basically the same process you're using now, right? We've been producing 200 proof since day one, and uh, it's just a matter of the denaturant. We've had to tweak the process a little bit just to you know, take out a few more of the impurities in that. Um, it's a little different in how we're packaging it, if you will. Um, you know, we're not packaging in bottles, but uh, you know, normally we would just ship out tankers. Um, but for distillers like these folks, they need it in a little bit smaller quantity so that we're packaging and in, like we said, the plastic totes that are like 275 gallons at a, at a crack. Are you thinking that you can ramp up uh, the volume that you do? Would, that, would this, this area support more volume? Well, I think it would support more fuel. Uh, uh, New York State, uh, around Thanksgiving, um, approved the use of E15 in the state which would be going from E10 to E15. So there's a 50% increase in fuel right there. And then you throw in the addition of sanitizer, uh, alcohol for sanitizers and things of that nature. Yeah, I see the potential for increased production in the future. Well, you know, you said at the beginning that you were up to about 65 million gallons. That's the potential we have. We're not running there today. 
Um, we obviously have slowed down a little because of the lack of fuel demand and things of that nature. But like I said, we're still, uh, um, we should, we're running at around a uh, 45 to 50 rate uh, currently. Some people think that ethanol is a government mandated uh, kind of a boondoggle, something that we really don't need or does more damage than, than help. Um, it, you're in the business. Mm -hmm. What's the real story behind that? Well, there is a mandate in place, but it's just that. Um, a lot of people uh, are under the misconception that we're subsidized, and that is not true. We do not receive a penny for that, but it, there is a mandate. Now, the mandate is in place as a part of where, where a lot of people, uh, where the misunderstanding comes in. The mandate is a part of the Clean Air Act under the EPA. The mandate is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The mandate is that you don't, you don't necessarily have to use ethanol, but you have to use a biofuel that re reduces greenhouse gas emissions in our fuel sort, uh, for vehicles and things of that nature. The alcohol that we produce that can be used in fuel is at least 20% less greenhouse gases when we produce it than gasoline. I would venture a guess we don't get credit necessarily for the hydropower that we use. I would venture a guess that uh, this plant uh, we are probably uh, have uh, lower emissions by maybe 30 to 35 percent um, compared to you know some other other plants in the U.S. But to your point, the thing that a lot of people don't understand is uh, gasoline needs octane, and the alcohol we produce is 114 octane. It is the cleanest octane available in the world. So when you go to the pump and you see uh, 85 octane on regular with 10% ethanol, which is what a lot of the pumps say they have, uh, how does that affect that 85 rating? Is that taking it up to 85, mm -hmm. basically? So without the, the ethanol, that gasoline would be a lot less uh, octane. The blend stock that comes from an, a gasoline refiner is in that, in, in, in here again, I'm not an expert on that per se, but it could be 85 octane, and then they have to blend, uh, most of what's at our pumps is 87. Um, they have to blend like a 10% ethanol at 114 octane to get up to 87. I, I think the biggest thing that, that I would say is just, you know, we really appreciate the support that we've gotten from um, not only the agencies, but uh, whether it be Orleans County, um, the Industrial Development Group uh, here in Orleans County. Um, you know, it's just been a all hands on deck type of thing. Um, you know, all of the businesses uh, exchanging information and working together. And like I said, I, I could not be prouder of the team here at Western New York Energy and what they've accomplished. Everyone has stepped up. Everyone has done their part to get us to where we're at today. Do you, um, do you have any idea how many other uh, companies throughout the country have kind of jumped on this uh, as well as you? I don't have an exact number, but I've heard there could be 10 or 12 other plants. Uh, fuel ethanol plants, there's around 200 across the country. And, uh, you know, so yeah, I understand there's could be 10 or 12 possibly um, that are working towards, you know, either getting to this point or are already producing um, san uh, alcohol for sanitizers. Now, just a quick calculation. If, if if you were at your maximum doing 65 million gallons mm -hmm. uh, in a year, then that would basically, it, if, if I'm correct, and it's 10%, that would be 650 million gallons of gasoline that correct. it blends with. Correct. Um, at that rate, we can just about meet the demand for Buffalo and Rochester gasoline. I, that's what I was going to ask. How yeah. far does that go? Yeah, our gasoline, it doesn't go very far. Okay. We are a truck plant, so all of our product uh, essentially leaves you a truck. What do you think of the electric uh, car uh, uh, trend that's coming? Well, I think there's a place for um, uh, all sorts of different technologies. I think we all have a responsibility to, uh, to look at not only just climate change, whether you stand, whether you believe it or not, but just think about the emissions. I mean, think about the smog in different cities in that. Um, look at the statistics that have come out from um, uh, American Lung Association the amount of kids that have asthma, things of that nature, a lot of that can be tied to the aromatics, the particles that come out of uh, gasoline emissions. And so I think we can all do our part to find cleaner forms. Um, electric 
Um, a lot of people think it's a, it's a zero emission f uh, fuel, but keep in mind there's emissions when they create that electricity, whether it's coal or natural gas. The power plant that's making that electricity is not zero emission. And so that all has our part, um, but I think ethanol can be a part of that as well. Um, I've heard of a car, an experiment, they're using alcohol, uh, ethanol to create, to fuel a fuel cell that is then obviously electric for transmission and things of that nature. So like I said, uh, I think there's a, I believe in kind of the all above approach and uh, I think alcohol is just one of those things that can play a part in uh, helping us all clean our air. Is there another potential use for this form of energy besides, I mean, you found another use uh, in this situation and mm -hmm. that's a sanitizer. Here we have the ethanol. Uh, is there another use for, for the product that you're, you're putting out there? I think there is. I think the technologies are, you know, catching up, but whether it's a fuel cell, whether it's uh, something else, yeah, I think uh, when you think about the 114 octane potential you have in this as a fuel, um, yeah, I think that there's, uh, I think there's other opportunities there. I couldn't tell you what they are today, but uh, there's certainly a lot of ideas out there. What about the cost of processing and coming up with a gallon of, of this? Uh, it, you know, 200 proof alcohol versus uh, a gallon of uh, gasoline at, at a certain octane rate. Most of the studies that I've read, gasoline production is energy deficit. In other words, they're using more energy than they're creating. Most of the studies that I've seen, uh, one of the things that I really love about the ethanol industry is even in 13 years, the efficiencies and the technologies that we've brought into our plant are uh, amazing and what we've, how we've been able to improve the process over the years. Most of the recent studies I've seen are plants like ours are probably creating two and a half to three units for every unit that we're consuming. Do you, do you and that's probably a good question, do you use your own product uh, to provide heat? For the distillery? We could. It's not quite as efficient as natural gas. Um, when you think about vehicles, you think about uh, a liquid fuel. And so we're putting it in a form, in the form of ethanol, that's more uh, conducive, if you will, to, uh, to vehicles. Whereas the heat source for our plant is, uh, is natural gas. In this time of bad news and doom and gloom, it's nice to be able to bring a positive story to you once in a while. I'd like to thank Tim Winters for talking to us today, and we wish Western New York Energy all the best in the future. Thank you for watching WBBZ, and as always, thank you for watching The Big Picture. We appreciate it, and we will see you next time on The Big Picture.